Um, tonight we are privileged uh, to have Carol Cornwall Madsen, who is Professor Emeritus of History at Brigham Young University. She uh, has been President of the Mormon History Association, former Vice Chair of the Board of Utah State History. Uh, as you all know, she's an award-winning author, and uh, some of her books are uh, she was one of the editors of the first 50 years of Relief Society. Very important book uh, done by Church Historians Press. Um, they've done very little outside of the Joseph Smith papers, and that that is one that um, uh, will stand the test of time. It's a very important book on uh, women and uh, Relief Society and the church. Uh, Award-winning book, An Advocate for Women, The Public Life of Emmeline B. Wells. Um, there are a number of others uh, as well, and she has won several uh, Best Book Awards and other awards for her writing. I wanted to read uh, a comment by Claudia Bushman um, about the book that we'll be talking about tonight, Emmeline B. Wells, An Intimate History. Uh, it's a beautiful book, University of Utah Press. And uh, Claudia said, Carol Madsen, having previously dealt with Emmeline Wells' public life, now ably explores her interior landscape, tracing the contrast between her public triumph and her private pain from her wild and fanciful youth to her unexpected humiliations. Wells' excellent record-keeping habit enables the rich detail of her story. Thank you. This extended and sympathetic inner biography of the best-known Mormon woman of her time is told largely in her own words, linked by Madsen's steady and judicious narrative. And I would just add, as I've been reading the book, um, I know a lot of historians, and uh, they're all very knowledgeable and very capable, but they vary a lot in their ability to communicate and to uh, combine history with uh, the kind of prose that one is drawn to that, that, that draws you into the story. And uh, I can say without any hesitation at all that uh, that Carol is a, not only a fine historian, but a fine writer. Her, her prose is, it just flows, and it, it, uh, it's wonderful. And I, I think that this is um, a perfect example of what she has become over decades of research and writing. So it's my privilege to turn the time over to Carol Cornwall Madsen. Can you hear me all right? Does it come through okay? Not very well. I didn't. Did we have that? Those chairs there? Sorry. Can we Can we just have you just scoot over just a bit there? Because I think we've got this centered for the camera and everything. Thank you very much. Um, is that are you? Is that going back there, Doug? I don't think it's, it's not picking going up. No, a little bit louder. It's a little. It's sketchy. not picking up. Yeah. Um, Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Is that, a, is that better? Can we turn it up a little? A little bit no, more. It still sounds like it's just The problem regular. is getting that on that lapel, the mic near enough to hear. Um, why don't you go ahead and do that? I don't want to get slapped. I can get it. Yeah, just do it in the middle there. That might work. Let's get that Sorry about that. Let's 
Let's see how that goes. Oh, you got to put it on. <laughs> okay. Okay, am I speaking loudly enough for those in the back? Yeah. Okay, all right, let's begin. I don't know how much any of you know about uh, Emmeline Wells. Let me just give a quick little summary of her uh, demographics, you might say. She was born uh, in a rural part of Massachusetts, in a little town of Petersham, Massachusetts. She was born on February 29th, 1828, and that was a very auspicious day uh, for her. She would always have wonderful birthday parties every four years because she felt she missed out on the other three years. But it was an auspicious day for an auspicious woman, and her life unfolded in, in a way that uh, certainly made her an, as unusual as the day that she was born. She lived a long life. She was 93 when she died on April 25, 1921, in Salt Lake City. She lived only 14 uh, years in Massachusetts, but she was a Massachusetts woman. She came to love Utah and her homes that, where she lived here in Utah. Loved everything about it, but, but there was part of her heart in, in Massachusetts throughout her life, as she wrote in the, the Woman's Exponent, and if you get to that in the book and read it, you'll see how dear it was to her all of her life. This, my book that I have written now is based on her diaries, but it, uh, and we have approximately 47. Some, some are only partial diaries, some have just a, a copy of a sermon that was given and so on, but, but we can roughly guess at about 47 diaries. And yet there were large swaths of time that she, uh, let me say that we don't have diaries. I know that some of those, uh, that there must have been some diaries during those long swaths of time that we don't have a diary because she makes reference to them in later diaries. She'll say something about this particular year that she wrote about in her diary, but we don't have them. so. That will be something for the next biographer to search for and fill in. She wrote for a few months after they left Nauvoo in 1846. Not a few months, really a few weeks, because she quit writing when the pioneers reached Garden Grove. And if you know anything about the trek, that was their first main stopping place where they built a small community. She uh, then picked up her diary in 1874, so we miss all those early years in Utah. Mm -hmm. And then it, the diary goes, with a few exceptions, almost every year until 1920. And so uh, we, we really have quite a bit to uh, look at in her diaries because they were not like the average diary that I have read over the years that most women wrote. They tell us about their household activities, their visiting of friends or family uh, doings. But Emmeline's is a very introspective diary. I don't know much about what her daily life was at home. I know enough that, to know that she uh, had a young woman, usually a um, a newly converted young woman who had come into the valley and was looking for work. And so she would mention something about this. And occasionally she would have a dinner party when one of those women got married. And, but those are just little happenings. Uh, I, I don't get any sense of a, a pattern in how she lived her daily life. Whereas um, the, so many other diaries just don't tell us how people, how the women felt about the experiences that uh, they had each day. She reflected her view of her world and of the larger world. And that was important to me as a biographer because I wanted this book to talk about or to tell us something about what her reaction was to everything that happened to her of any importance or that I could draw from her diaries. And um, 
I wanted to know how, how she responded to these things and to the larger events that were happening in the Mormon church at that time and in the nation. This was the beginning of a woman's rights movement in the 19th century. And my earlier book talks about uh, what you might call her feminist leanings. That's a, a word sh she didn't use. It was not used in the 19th century, but it suggests some of her her attitudes toward what was happening for women at that time. And that's part of this book as well. Now what method did I use to write the book? I don't know that I can say that I had, or that I began with a, a method other than I wanted to show this woman's life. I wanted other women of the church, I wanted men and women to understand the, um, the uh, in workings of men in authority, either in the church or in political office, and women who were activist women, or even those who just helped out now and again with the uh, passing out leaflets for the governor of Utah or whatever, uh, how, how they, they work together, the interlinking of their lives. And that comes through very much in Emmeline's life, because she was called on so often by uh, various church leaders for her response to different things, for her uh, her attitude or her suggestions on events that were to take place. She was very familiar with all the, the presidents of the church from Brigham Young, uh, well, from Joseph Smith on. I So, as I tried to say, is I wanted her to tell her own story. There was so much in the diary that um, just told such a different story from the one I had written in the Advocate book where she was very active in women's issues that I, I felt that if rather than thinking of uh, uh, some preconceived notion of what I think she was or who I thought she, th thought she was or uh, how I could fit her into some some kind of category of a woman's life that most people would do, would do if they're approaching writing a biography. For example, in today's politic writing, political writing, somebody might take someone who is a, a very active liberal and find everything within that person's writings or minutes of meetings he attended or whatever else it might have been as to why he was a liberal. We all were fitting him for what he said he was and what his life showed he was into this pattern. But I've, I've turned it, I've, I've let the theme of my book be Emmeline's story about herself. So that rather than using her diary entries or other writings as my resource to prove the point I wanted to make, I've let the diaries guide me as to what I needed to say. And my contribution to the book has been in connecting these disparate events in her life, her feelings and attitudes. I've tried to give some contextual background so that the reader knows something about why this is happening or why she's feeling this way. And uh, then let her move on to the next event or the next time period that needs to be covered in her life. I found it very interesting uh, because she so desperately wanted to be a poet. She lived in New England and this was uh, that early part of the 19th century. Women were beginning to uh, work in journalism. They were m editing magazines. They were writing poetry. Not, of a, not all of it of an Emily Dickinson quality, of course. But they were published in newspapers, their poems were published, newspapers and magazines. And this was her great ambition, was to be a well-known poet and to write good poetry. The only problem is she was not a good poet. And her, her writings in poetry will sometimes have some brilliant and unusual imagery in them. But most of the time it's, it's pretty pedantic and all. So I thought, how can I, it was so important to her to be a poet. Why, how do I work this in? I don't want to just have a chapter on her poetry and do nothing but try to criticize, or criticize it. And I'm not 
uh, in a position to be able to do that. Anyway, I'm, I don't have a literary critic's background. So I started just reading it more, and I had the diaries with me, and I realized that her poetry, much of it, was autobiographical. And this just began to fill out some things and some thoughts and feelings about events in her life that I could not have obtain just from reading her diaries. The, the, she was able to transfer some of the diary feelings and thoughts into poetry, and I, because I could get some dates of the poetry and uh, to correspond with what was in the diary, I could see how she transferred some of her deep feelings that were expressed in the diary that no one else would know about but she could, she could somehow generalize those feelings in the form of a poem. And that, that was such a revelation to me. So that gave me the way how to, that I could bring in her poetry to the, uh, the book itself. I could put it in at, at the time an event happened and say something about she wrote about it. And, and somebody, she always wanted her husband, Daniel Wells, to approve of it. And, she wasn't sure he even read her poetry, but occasionally we do get an opinion from him, and it's always very interesting to see that. Well, there were some considerations I had to face in writing this volume also. Uh, I had uh, debated before I wrote the first volume of Emmeline as to how I should go about it. I knew she, I had these huge, wonderful diaries that were so, uh, gave us so much passage into her inner landscape, as Claudia called it. And yet, um, I heard at various conferences historians that were talk, who were kind of experts on biography, saying, uh, some of them, don't ever try to bifurcate a person's life that you're writing about. Blend everything in together so that you get the whole picture. That made sense to me. But I thought, she has left such an enormous paper trail. How can I do her justice if I mix it all together? Because one tells one story about this woman, and the other tells another story about her. So I spent many years trying to decide whether or not I should attempt another book and tell a little bit more about her personal life. And also, I, as any biographer does, I had to realize, I did realize, that many of her descendants are still living. They know her daughter, Annie, because that was their grandmother, and that's as far back as any of them could remember that I interviewed years ago, Annie Wells Cannon. But they didn't know a lot about uh, Emmeline. And uh, so it, as I interviewed some of these women, they just talked about how wonderful Annie and her husband were, because most of them just, were descendants just, of uh, Annie and John Q. It disconnected. The sound just went out. <laughs> Sorry. Battery? It's nothing you did. <laughs> not, not not Maybe I shouldn't say what I was going to say. Let's see. Lost mic. I could talk loud enough. Yeah, I think grab a couple. Yeah, I bet it's battery. Let's see. Let me grab a couple. Again. Just one. One. Yeah. Of course, it would go out right now. Not <laughs> well, I can shout. <clears throat> Is he looking for a battery? He's just grabbing them real quick. We'll okay. pop it back in. Which should be good. <clears throat> Okay, is that on now? Great, good for the batteries. Um, 
so, so I debated uh, what I should do, whether I should even write another book or not, just let it go, because some of her personal life, of course, was included in the other book. I had to round out many areas that I discussed. But then I realized, after reading her, writing that book, and reading her diary again, and really getting acquainted, that her life was hyphenated by dualities in so many different areas that she herself uh, was living uh, not a double life, but, but had a private life and a public life. And as far as she could, could control it, never the twain should meet. But um, as I was going through this process, I read another poem that she wrote, of Faith and Fidelity, which was a kind of an autobiographical poem talking about the loss of her first husband then the appearance of Newell K. Whitney, who saved her from desolation and all al being all, all alone in Nauvoo and not knowing anyone, and, um, and yet just aching for this young husband that had, in effect, deserted her as far as she knew. And she wrote one measure, I mean, there, I'd like to read just one measure in that poem that, that helped me start thinking about uh, whether or not I could, should go ahead with another book. She said, and so some lives, and think, talking about herself, go on in tragedies, each part to be sustained by effort grand. Though neath the outward seeming lies the broken heart that only one above can understand. And I thought, that's it, that, there's her dual life. She had a broken heart all of her life, but she could not have accomplished the things that she did unless she could subsume that, that sorrow in some way and let the public work uh, take over. And it was at night when she was alone that she wrote and let the hard part of her life fall, uh, fall into place in the diary. And then I read a little part of a biograph the biographical sketch that her daughter Annie had written about her, and that confirmed my decision to go ahead. Annie wrote this of her mother. She said, there has been so marked a, dif uh, marked a difference between her public and her private life, and because those traits and high ideals, which at the same time allow public service, also shield with equal zeal the innermost thoughts and activities of the home. And so if her own daughter could see this kind of duality in her life, I thought, okay, I'm going to go on that. So I started years ago on this book and had other, other things to do, like the Relief Society history and so on. But at any rate, um, what we see here is when we look at her public life as it's expressed in so many articles written in newspapers in, in her own paper, The Woman's Exponent, and elsewhere, we see this very peripatetic woman always on the go, always involved in some meeting somewhere, sometime. And then we see quietly at night, as she writes in her diary, a woman that is, is full of heartbreak and that she um, is is, let's see, what have I put here? She was often sickly and a very heart-hungry romantic. At age 16 in Nauvoo, after the desertion of her first husband, she um, called herself, um, a, or she called her life, she said, my life is a romance, using the literary term romance with all of its ups and downs and, and mysteries and so on. Uh, and the interesting thing is, her life did indeed turn out to be in that genre. It was very much a romance, and she doesn't refer to that idea very much later on, but, but she, uh, her life really followed that. And set, there were some other writers about her who, who mentioned that her life was that, uh, in that particular genre. Well, uh, most obviously, you can see the dualities in her writing. <clears throat> when she first started writing for The Woman's Exponent in 1872, 
right after it was uh, established in Salt Lake with Lula, uh, Lula Green Richards as the first editor, she started writing regular uh, columns under the name Blanche Beechwood. Now I know she loved trees and she loved the hemlocks best of all. Blanche was her middle name. But Blanche Hemlock probably had a connotation <laughs> that wouldn't have been too great, and it certainly was not as, as alliterative or as uh, nice as Blanche Beach with women everywhere. I have a whole list. I don't know whether I can't remember whether I included it in the book. It might be in a footnote of prominent women. They all used some kind of a tree uh, for their second name, uh, their surname. But they all use pseudonyms. But anyway, in, in the exponent, she wrote these uh, wonderful, what, what we might call, looking at it from today, feminist articles uh, about men and women in marriage, how, we, how they could, there could be more equality, about men not revealing to their wives what their financial conditions are, uh, and that she put, uh, used the pseudonym Emile, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. And then um, she, she, uh, 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 she talked about men not letting women really express themselves, that they were really just a necessity in the household to, to cook their meals and do their wash and speak when spoken to, but not anything on their own. So, uh, I, I've always looked at those early Blanche Beachwood articles that she wrote as, as the real feminist woman coming through. But then again, when I was putting this book together, I realized that the time she was writing, and she picked up her diaries in 1874, two years after the exponents got started, right when she was writing all of these articles, she was having very difficulties with Daniel H. Wells. He just wasn't around. She, everything she wrote about came right out of her own experience in marriage. And again, she was just generalizing from her experience to the lives of others, so that all of a sudden those particular essays had a different meaning to me than just somebody making generalizations. And I often wondered how she got away with it, with uh, her book, her, her newspaper being shipped all over Utah and everybody reading it and being endorsed by Brigham Young because she could be pretty harsh in what she wrote. But that putting together all these different sources of her life really uh, helps to understand this uh, in individual woman. So um, I... Oh, so she wrote under Blanche Beachwood, and then she wrote under and M. And uh, all of those articles, and they go all the way through the Woman's Exponent up to the time that it concluded in 1914. And M wrote all these beautiful evocations of her life in New England. She just uh, had to write about it. So I learned about their Thanksgivings and their Christmases and her family gatherings and how much her life had meant to her during those few years she lived there. But I got so much information about her childhood just from those memories uh, of, of New England. She also wrote short stories and poetry using the name uh, Aunt M. And she was known after a while around the community as Aunt M. So, um, I, I found that by kind of focusing on this inner landscape in, in various ways, that it helped me to reconcile some of the, what were clearly dualities in her life, so that I have no compunction. There may be critics who say they should have been, that I should have blended the two books, but I did it my way. And I know that there will be many who follow me uh, because sometime, uh, her diaries, when we get them all uh, finished editing, will be online or be available, and, and, and then she, uh, anyone can write about her. So, um, 
Now, I'd like to just conclude, I just have a few more minutes, just in a few statements she made. Uh, let's see, I think I've got another one. About uh, the loss of her husbands. Just a statement of, in her, from her diary about the three losses because she outlived them all. Um, she was about 16 when she realized James was not going to be coming back, her first husband, and uh, she, she, her diary is full. Uh, it, it's not very long, but her diary there in Nauvoo when he left her just after the death of their one son that was born, he left in November 1844 and this, the little son had been born in September of 1844. But, he, but she wrote when, when uh, he left words like this, and this is one section of what she wrote. Oh God, wilt thou long suffer this? Must I forever be unhappy? Will the time never come when happiness and enjoyment will be the lot of this lump of clay? When thraldom and oppression will be cast off? And she has many more pages and diary entries written that way. And I think, how many 16-year-olds today would write in quite, quite that way? Then, um, then she married Newell K. Whitney in uh, 1846. And he died uh, very unexpectedly uh, in 18, no, she married him in 1845. And he died in Salt Lake in, in 1850. She had two daughters with him, Mel, uh, Isabel and Malvina, and that would be Bell and Mel, as they were always written about in her diary. But um, he died, he just, he was sick one day, died the next day, and, it, and this time she's in her 20s. And she said, I was left like one in a dream, but oh, such a sad awakening, no bright ray to shine on my pathway at all. Life seemed hardly worth struggling for. And then, many years later, she lived nearly 40 years as the wife of Daniel H. Wells. <clears throat> she married him in 1852. Very poignant. This happens to be one of my favorite uh, passages because, and it's important to me because I have seen how everything has brought her to this point. And also, as I have seen and learned about her friends, all of them in polygamy, to realize they all, in one way or another, experience this. And I have such a high regard for the women who saw that kind of marriage as a, a divine commandment and stayed true to it, as difficult as it was, it was just amazing to me to, uh, to see how she reacted to being a polygamous wife. She was the sixth polygamous wife. And the first wife who, was, who married him in Nau married Daniel in Nauvoo did not join the church. <coughs> so he had six wives in Utah, all rather close to each other. Anyway, um, she wrote this when he died. She had been to the house when he passed on. She had been there uh, the next day as they were preparing him for his funeral in the tabernacle. And then she came home. She said, I, I just can't stand to be around anybody. And then she wrote this, if he were here with me, even in death, it would be a comfort. But no, only memories, only the coming and the going and the parting at the door, the joy when he came, the sorrow when he went, as though all the light died out of my life." And uh, it, it's a pretty poignant uh, statement that she made, but the whole story, I could, I could tell you the whole story of their relationship or Newell K. Whitney's relationship or her relationship with James because they all ended in different ways or, or progressed in different ways or came into being in such different ways. But uh, you'll have to read the book to learn that. But now I, it's time for us to talk about questions and answers. When Emmeline uh, 
finally uh, reached her 80s, she experienced the loss of her eyesight. And her last entry that she wrote in the diary is just a scribble. She just couldn't quite see the, the pages of the small diary, and it's kind of, but you can make out what she had to say. But she was a, an inveterate diarist, so she asked Annie to please write her diary for her, whether she dictated it or whether Annie just kind of observed what her mother was doing and wrote it up. I, I don't know. There's no way of knowing that. And it's in, in Annie's handwriting, of course. So she, she had help. And the diaries were kept right up until a year before she died, or about six months before she died, actually. Well, when I reached my 80s, I discovered that I had a loss of hearing. So I turned to my friend, uh, Kurt, who has graciously agreed to repeat the questions in case I miss a word or don't hear it perfectly. And I want to be sure I hear every question, if you have any, uh, to give to us. So. Okay. No questions. Well, let's give her a hand first. Uh, uh, Lots of questions, but I'll toss out two to begin. So the missing diaries, are those from the 50s and 60s? Or did she not simply write any diaries during those years at all? What period do you think the missing diaries are from? Uh, they are, <clears throat> well, as I explained, <clears throat> she wrote uh, in 1846. Right. And then nothing right. again until uh, 1874. Seven. But she refers to right. a diary or two. So okay. I don't know whether they're okay. missing or they were divided up among families or, or, or what. So. Okay, and along with that, I was going to ask you, what drove her to be so overtly feminist and stalwart in public? And as you were talking, I thought it must have been the pain, but that difference between the private Emmeline and the public Emmeline, the public Emmeline was pretty rare. The other, very few other women were as strongly feminist as she was. I mean, you've got Melissa, mm -hmm. Sarah, Sarah Granger Kimball, and a few others. But what drove her to be so publicly feminist? Was it the pain? The was that how she dealt with the private well, pain? Well, I think that uh, I attribute it, uh, first of all, to the death of her father when she was just four, okay. leaving ten children for her mother to take uh -huh. care of. And her mother, who was a bright smart woman. Uh, Emmeline idolized her mother, <clears throat> and uh, it was very difficult uh, for her to see her mother, who had no, no alternative but to, to marry again, really. She didn't have the credentials to teach. She didn't have the room to bring to, uh, boarders in, and, and Emmeline made reference to the fact that women just simply had no no alternative to be on their own. They, they simply depended on a man. And she did marry again, mm -hmm. but he is not in Emmeline's diary. He, only uh, one or two mentions how, how he had custody over the children until they were, what, 18? And um, mm -hmm. so all of her years until she was 14, he, he had the right to make, give her permission this stepfather uh, of marrying, which she did at 14, but he evidently did not, or whether he was out of the family. And her mother had one son by him, who was the darling of the family, Hiram they, and all, but that, that I th is, I think, the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's in her nature, a little as with many other women of mm -hmm. her time, they mm -hmm. just and, and there was agitation. You've got uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth State, T Caddy Stanton, who are mm -hmm. out visiting different states trying to, or, or territories, trying to get them to uh, include women's suffrage when they became states, and so on. So it was there. And in the 1870s, the revolution, which was put, edited by Susan B. Anthony, was uh, uh, subscribed to by many Utah women. So mm -hmm. it was around her and mm -hmm. all. And mm -hmm. she, she had her own, own, she was earning her own living by that time too. Mm -hmm. And if she hadn't had the exponent, she, she could have taught school. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
What was Emmeline's uh, relationship to church leaders? How did she describe in these diaries just dealing with the presidents of the church, the twelve, you know, the counselors? Mm -hmm. Is there much insight that she gives on that between church hierarchy and what she was doing and just how she reacted to it? Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> she, she uh, respected them and uh, in every way that one would expect her to do. And when I think about, say, Joseph F. Smith and uh, some of the others uh, that she knew, they all, they all experienced the same thing. They all lived in Nauvoo. They all experienced the martyrdom. They experienced the Trail West together and all, with all of the difficulties of settling Utah and so on. So here were, here were men who were really her equal in terms of experiencing and giving up much for the church. But, but she really respected their positions. She would sometimes say um, something about, uh, well, we'll have to go around a little carefully with this one because he's not quite as interested in this as we are or something. But she, I don't recall any really <laughs> derogatory comment at all that she ever made. But they called on her very often. For example, when Brigham uh, H. Roberts was uh, running for Congress, uh, they were very upset because he was a member of the Council of Seventy and it had church leadership. And they, um, they had the, the vote and he won the, the election. And she was so upset because he'd been an anti-suffragist. Mm -hmm. And she was upset and she said, he couldn't have won without women's vote. And why would women do this? And, and she was so upset uh, about it. And she went to Wilford Woodruff, I think he was the president at that time, and talked about it. And he had said to her earlier, anything you can do that would stop his campaigning or, or election, uh, please do, you know. <laughs> And uh, she just got a lot of cooperation, and they called on her when it looked like Salt Lake was going to have a Gentile mayor for the first time. Can you route the women and get them out to vote against him or take leaflets out? But that's kind of a long answer, but yes, she, and they seemed to respect her, and, and they never told her not to continue uh, with the exponent, even though she, you know, was after some of them in a very general way about not voting for women's suffrage. Yes. Uh, I just would like to add that, uh, you know, she greatly influenced a future apostle, her uh, nephew, uh, Orson F. Whitney. Do you bring that out? Well, he, he was, did you all hear the question? He, he wanted to know if about Orson F. Whitney, her nephew, and uh, if she deals with with him very much in the book. And she, I think I wouldn't say she shaped him totally, but they were very close, and he, he she was his aunt, and Orson F. Whitney is, uh, you know, becomes an apostle. Yes, he um, <clears throat> Orson F. Whitney courted her daughter Emma. Uh, before Emma died, and uh, so they were very close that way. And then some years later, they, she had Emma sealed to Orson F. Whitney, though he had married another woman. She was very close to him. He was the son she didn't have, and he adored her. And they, they, um, th 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 there were so many things that they liked together, both music, and Emma was a great guitarist and singer as was Orson, and she, she did influence him a great deal, and he put out one issue of a, a very feminist newspaper called Men and Women, and uh, you can see Emmeline's thinking all the way through it, but he, um, 
he, he was a very popular speaker in this city anyway, and, but I think she, she, he just became very sensitized to women's and women's concerns. So that she had that much influence, but they were just very close family. Yeah. Yes, sir. What do we know about her first husband and the desertion and what happened to him? What do we know about her first husband and the desertion and what happened to him? Oh, that is quite a story. Uh, <laughs> I'll abbreviate it, but it, it reads better in the book. But <laughs> anyway, she married James Harris in Massachusetts. They were both 14. Her, mo her mother wanted to get Emmeline to Nauvoo, where the church was settled at that time. This would have been in, well, 1843 and 1844. And so they, um, she arranged for uh, Emmeline to go with this family, the Harris family, to Nauvoo. And they had a son, um, James Harris, the same age, and they arranged for this marriage. Uh, between the two of them. I don't know exactly why they felt they had to be married or whether that had something to do with this guardian, the, the second husband of her mother. I, d I don't know what, why they felt these two young people should be married, although that age was not unusual at the time <clears throat> for marriage. But she, um, so they came to Nauvoo in 1844. Just, they arrived just two months before Joseph Smith was killed, and uh, the in-laws, with all the turmoil that followed that summer, the, the in-laws moved back uh, elsewhere in Illinois, and um, she and her husband, James, decided to stay in Nauvoo, and I, I'm sure that was Emmeline's choice to do that. And uh, then she had her baby in September, which they lost a week, six weeks later. Then he said, I can't find work here. I'm going to St. Louis. And many people did go to St. Louis from Nauvoo. That was the big city. They could go down the river, earn money, send it home or bring it home or bring goods home, whatever. So that was his plan. And he wrote back to her once or twice, telling her to go and live with his parents. Uh, in a, another town in Illinois, and uh, she did not want to do that. They'd left the church, and she she was there. She wanted to stay with the church, and uh, so she did not ever go to stay with his parents, and uh, then she never heard from him again. I think he had assumed she had gone with the parents. So that so then she did get word. Uh, later that he had joined the uh, Navy, I guess, whatever it was called at that time. A lot of young men from Massachusetts went into the maritime uh, for, for their professions. But she, but she didn't know where or when uh, he would be back or anything about him. And then she married Neil K. Whitney, even while she was still pining for James and hoping he would come back to Nauvoo. So in 1859, and I got most of the details from the poem, uh, This Faith and Fidelity, but also poem, uh, other sources, that she learned that he had died in Calcutta in a ship's explosion or something. Calcutta, India. So that she wrote about that and how unexpected to hear from him. Then, nearly 35 years later, she she'd been back to see her mother-in-law, whose husband. See, it's a little complicated. Her husband had died, and she moved back to Massachusetts. Her mother-in-law, Harris, and um, was a widow for the second time, and. Uh, so when Emmeline started making her, her political trips back to Washington, she would go back to Massachusetts. And several times she visited her um, mother-in-law, and they, they would visit, and it would be very uh, formal and all, but anyway, they had their visits. 
So in, in 1893, she received in Salt Lake City a packet of letters. Her, her mother-in-law had died and her, her niece, the mother-in-law's niece had bought the home or been given the home and was living there and wrote to Emmeline and said, I found this packet of letters and they're all addressed to you. And when she opened them, they were all from James and they had been sent to her mother-in-law and um, thinking that Emmeline was with her. And anyway, he must have wondered why she didn't ever answer. But that, that is the sad story. And then there is a, a little PS that goes with the story that I, I have two sources to say that it occurred. But, but I don't know for sure whether it did or not. But it, uh, excuse me, just a minute. The story goes, and it was told by Emmeline's niece, who was with her on this visit, along with Emmeline's sister, her, the niece's mother. So the three of them, uh, had gone to visit the mother, or the home where the mother-in-law had lived, and there she was given the packet of letters. And she came back to their little carriage, and she said, take me to the cemetery. I want to see her grave. And so she was taken to the cemetery, and Emmeline, who was never taller than five feet, never larger than 100 pounds, stood over the grave and raised her hands to heaven and according to the the account um, drew drew down drew down such a curse upon her mother-in-law that she said i'm sure the woman uh, shook in her shroud and <laughs> surprised us all i would love to see that scene but but i have two accounts of it whether it's just in the family or not and whether what she wrote in her poem was a little bit apocryphal that the letters were sent to her or whether she actually got them, I don't know. But she didn't mention it in her diary for a year after she had been back to see her mother-in-law and she never wrote about that incident in the cemetery in her diary. So uh, it's a good story. <laughs> Family. Traits. Okay. Uh, and it, anything more? How we do? It? Yes, sir. Carol, what does she have to say about her daughter's relationship with John Q. Cannon? Does she comment much about that? Oh, I'll say. Okay. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> that was a hard part when you've got a little difficulty, as we would say in our family, in in the family uh, that you really don't want anyone to know about, but they do know about it and. She did have, have uh, she adored John Q, like everybody else. He must have been a very charismatic man. He was the husband of Annie, the, her one, one, the one Wells daughter. There were three Wells daughters, and two of them died as young women, and Annie survived. She was the middle daughter, and had married John Q. Cannon, the son of George Q. Cannon, the oldest son. And very popular man, very had many many friends. But he also lived a little bit on the edge. Uh, he liked to go to the particular hotel where most of the Gentile visitors or businessmen came, and play cards and smoke their cigars and drink a little beer and so on. And he was one with them quite often. His father was very much aware of that, and and. Uh, he tried to get him off that track, but um, it, it turned out that he also fell in love before this, the youngest, da youngest Wells daughter died, fell in love with Louie, as her name was, and um, didn't, could not get permission to marry her as a polygamous wife to Annie, although Annie approved of it. And, but they evidently did get together and uh, Louie was pregnant and went to San Francisco to live with her older sister Belle, one of the Whitney daughters. And um, John Q stayed, he was excommunicated from the church. 
and uh, she died in childbirth. Louis died in childbirth. Very sad story. And I tried to approach it again. How did this affect Emmeline? How did it affect their family interaction? I mean, Annie's the the injured party in all of this, but but Emmeline was not going to let her family split over this problem, and she she held it together. She's quite amazing at that. So yes, a couple more. Um, so in addition to the difference, the split between the public and the private that you've talked about, public and private, Emmeline, then you were also dealing with a third level of Emmeline who wouldn't even confess a lot of what she was feeling or doing or thinking to her own diary. So were there sort of three levels of Emmeline? Well, I think uh, even though she, well, one thing I've struggled with is, she, would she mind her diary being exposed? And then I realized that quite often, uh, she, when she feels there's a little conspiracy against her, she never mentions 